Also, as it's our uh, final and observance of Black History Month, we're very privileged. Of course, we save the very best for last, right? We have Dr. Corey Montgomery here to talk about some of the contributions to medical and technology from African Americans. Corey, come on up. You guys know Corey, he's been here for 10 years. You know, Corey is the first African American ever to hold a chaired position at UAMS. Yeah. And he's got quite a story to tell and uh, much to share with us this morning. All right, so this is my second time around. So, um, so um, uh, next slide, please. So a lot of times people ask um, to me, why is it important to celebrate or even talk about Black History Month? And um, I've heard about this for many months um, try, when Harry asked me to try and put together uh, a brief talk to try and give emphasis or understanding of why it's important for us to talk about it and things, et cetera. But the way I wanted to do it, I wanted to go and kind of go through, uh, that's my daughter, so she sees me, so she's kind of deaf. So, um, so she wanted, I wanted to try and present a way that we kind of go through time to explain our encounters and et cetera. So thanks, Bert. So next slide. <laughs> so um, I wanted to start out in the latter part of the 1800s and talk about some of the things that African Americans have contributed to um, uh, medicine, but at the same time emphasize the time in which they were in and talk about the prominence that brought them to fame and also some of the pain that encountered with the times in which they were living in. The first one is George Washington Carver, frequently referred to as the, um, the peanut man. He didn't necessarily discover peanut butter, but he actually revolutionized the utilization of peanuts because during that time, the primary um, technology or the industry was agriculture. And so he had over 400 inventions, not necessarily pertaining only to peanuts, but also to cotton and other different crops in that time. But that was the things that brought him the prominence. The things that, were, that caused him pain during that time to it, merely because of his race, was actually he was born into slavery. Um, he was also possibly even castrated during that time because of his race, because there was concern that him being a male slave and the master of that time had a young female daughter, that there was concern that he was castrated in order to minimize interaction between the two. And lastly, as you can notice, that if he has over 400 different inventions, he was highly intelligent, but at the same time, he was denied admission to many different um, universities merely because of his race. Next slide. As we continue through time, you see another very prominent individual by the name of Daniel Hale. He was a very prominent um, cardiothoracic surgeon, a heart surgeon. He operated on um, patients. And he was considered to be one of the first individuals to actually successfully um, uh, perform an open heart surgery. So essentially, he was able to open the, the um, thorax of the heart open and close it because he was a stab victim, and that actually victim went on to heal. You think about the abilities of that because of the time, the limitations, the anesthesia, that this was quite a feat for that time in regards to him able to be able to successfully do it. The other important thing to realize is that he also wanted to make sure that medical care was equivalent amongst all individuals, and given the fact that um, if you imagine in the latter part of the 1800s, um, there was a lot of separation between whites and blacks, that he actually created his own hospital. Some of the pains that led to the creatization of his own hospital because he was actually not allowed to be a physician at those other major hospitals in the Chicago area. So the prominence that he brought about, very skilled, intelligent surgeon, but at the same time, his race was a limitation to allow him to interact with other individuals. Next slide, please. And you, as you see that, we move on to now we're in the early 1900s. Another very prominent African-American physician by the name of Charles Drew. He was considered to be very important to blood banking. He was considered, some even referred to him as the father of blood banking. And you say, well, what is that? Blood banking is essentially the understanding of how able we were able to bank blood. And he did a lot of research during his time to understand the different stereotypes, meaning that AB negative, AB positive. So he had immense understanding of that. To such an extent, he was actually named the director of the the, um, um, blood, uh, Red Cross for World War II. So this is a very prominent position because you think about is that a lot of individuals being um, injured during the war and they needed to have blood in order to maintain um, the hematocrits and blood counts for those individuals. But that brought him the um, prominence. But what brought him the pain is that at the same time, it was felt that blacks' blood were not equivalent to whites' blood. So essentially, during that time, blood was segregated. So they had blood for whites and they had blood for blacks. And with him having such a strong understanding and knowledge of blood banking, he realized that it was no difference between the two. And that, allowed, and that actually led to him actually stepping down as a director of Red Cross during that time because of the segregation of blood at that time. 
Next slide. We'll get a little bit closer to home. Um, Edith Irby Jones, a very prominent uh, African American physician, actually here from Arkansas. She's actually from Conway. And what brought her to prominence is because she was actually the first African American ever accepted to UAMS here at Arkansas. And that was actually in 1948. And also, she was considered to be the first black admitted to a majority white school here in the South. So a lot of the local news uh, companies and also national news companies picked this story up. And then she also even became the second, no, sorry, the first African American female to actually be admitted admitted to Baylor Medical School. She was the first intern there. That was her prominence, her prominence of breaking grounds, of being the first. The pain of that is that she was, even though she was admitted to UMS, she was not allowed the same dining privileges. She was not allowed to go to use the restroom, nor did she have the same lodging privileges. So yes, she was allowed to participate, but in a limited fashion. And even when she was able to go to Baylor, she was actually so marred by her experiences there, she actually had to transfer because she had so many limitations on what she could do as a physician there, she later transferred to another residency program in Baylor. So you, as you see, the time is going on. So it's 1927, next slide. Another prominent Arkansan, he was actually um, became um, admitted to um, UMS in 1954. He was a prominent transplant surgeon. A transplant surgeon is a physician who transplant different organs. And one of the first organs to be really truly transplanted was the kidney. And so he actually really pioneered a lot of the techniques for kidney transplants, meaning that what, when you transfer one kidney from one person to another, you have a lot of concerns about rejection. And he was one of the first to start utilizing steroids in order to minimize the rejection between different individuals. And he was actually the first, in the, well, actually one of the first individuals in, on the West Coast to successfully uh, have a kidney transplant. And he did over 200 kidney transplants, which was actually one of the highest numbers of any physician during that time period. So, but some of the prominence that he brought led to also some pain because it was also felt in that time. You can see now, this is actually 1930, 1991, 1981, that there were still concerns about organs being donated across races. And he really wanted to champion that, that ideal of that there was no difference between the kidney of an African American and the kidney of a, of a white. Um, and so he really pushed that. And so even you see now, even the latter part of the 1981s, there are still issues going on as well. And that leads to, next slide to my story. So what is, how do I have to play into this? What does that mean? Because I'm no one special. I'm just a very country boy from Southern Mississippi who went to a historically black university there. I'm not, not highly special trained or anything like that, but I had a loving family and my faith has always led me to who I am to now. And that led me to many, many different things in which my current family here is now, and I've been a member at Mosaic. So even with now, next slide, that the things that have brought me prominence, including various things in which you can read here, is that I still have pain. And the pain of being a physician here in society today is still led to various things um, such as we have today. Number one is that the reluctance of some of my patients, um, whenever I take care of them, particularly the parents, um, reluctant to shake my hand. And or if you do get to shake your hand, you kind of feel like it's a weak handshake. You kind of know when someone really doesn't want to shake your hand, at least I do. The second thing is that probably has hurt me the most during my time here as a physician is that the reluctance of uh, lack of recognition. For example, this is one particular situation, which I kind of described earlier. I'll try not to get emotional about it this time around. Is that I'm actually about to start a case, and if you've looked at different television shows, and you can see that you know the surgeon is asking for the knife, and the and the assistant called the scrub tech is you know is going to pass the surgeon the knife, and and I asked Kedrick, another African American, to pass me the knife, and he was um, assisting me for that case, and I was about to make the inc an incision in order to start the case. And the young physician reaches over the, um, the drapes and yells out, whoa, 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 what are you doing? And I'm shocked, I'm like, what are you, what's going on? And he looks at me and says, you can't start the case until the surgeon gets here. And I'm like, so I'm, I'm gonna move on. But even with that, <laughs> even with that, um, that hurt, things like that. And even some of my patients refer to me to head in in charge or if I did a really good job, um, it was in rigged together. That stuff hurts. And to this day, I say to you all is that that's why, next slide, that it's important for us as, um, as African Americans to celebrate our, our culture, who we are, what are we doing, and also our achievements as well. Because sometimes if we don't tell that story amongst ourselves and also allow for others to realize it, that we've made contributions, we're still making contributions, it will not otherwise be appreciated. Next slide. And I thought when I was putting this slide, finishing up this um, um, 
poem came to mind um, by another um, person who, did, who was not raised in Arkansas, but she actually spent some time here, um, and she was raised by grandparents in Stamps, Arkansas, um, and, and it's called I Rise. And it says, leaving behind the nights of terror and fear, I rise into the daybreaks that's wonderfully clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. So thank you for the opportunity. Stay with me again. Yeah, Corey, um, awesome. So what does the scripture say about what we just heard? Number one, we are one body, right? And the prominence and the rejoicing of the fact that we get to see this brother break new ground, the whole body rejoices over that. Yes. And at the same time, the fact that he has to still endure pain and hurt in the process, we divide that with him, do we not? And so we would like to just pray for the Montgomerys. I don't know if Brooke is still here or not. She's in the back. Oh, come on up, Brooke. This is the other Dr. Montgomery, by the way. Anybody wants to come lay hands on them, come on up. The Montgomerys have been here for quite a while. And let's just pray that the Lord would bless them and continue to keep them, continue to strengthen them. So if you want to just surround this family, let them know they are loved. Let them know how special they are. Let's just pray and ask God to continue this work. Lord, we are so humbled. I am so humbled to be called this family's pastor. We're so grateful. They give you so much glory. We give you so much glory because of them. And just like the Bible verse says, we rejoice as they rejoice, and we suffer as they have suffered. We multiply the joy. We divide the sorrow. We're in this together, Lord. And so I pray that every moment that Corey or Brooke feels discouraged or hurt, that there'd be a thousand other reasons, joyful ones, thankful ones, that their brothers and sisters are surrounding them, thanking God for them, uplifting them, go before them in all that they do. We pray so much favor in front of them as they go forward that they would just stand back amazed at how good you are bless them protect them keep them bless this wonderful family bless the member that's on its way we rejoice in that as well we love you lord and thank you for all that you're doing we pray it in christ's name amen, amen. thank you guys